Good Friday afternoon, evening, wherever you may be. How you doing? Hello. Guess what? This is going to be a short one today because I have a meeting I have to go to. And so does Victor. So we're going to shoot for about 40 minutes. So we're going to get into it. Uh, yes, you are the first. Help me, Victor. What's his first name? Uh, Engin. Engin. Okay. I was wondering I'm if the guessing. G was a hard... I, that's why I was guessing, too. I, I'm guessing it's a hard G and not a soft G. Not like engine. That would be... Would that I work? Know, I pronounce things incorrectly all the time, so it might be engine. Okay. It would be cool, engine. <laughs> so it would work. Uh, by the way, hi, everybody. In case you don't know who we are, my name is Darren Pope. This over here is Victor Farsik. And we are the co-host of a podcast called DevOps Paradox. And on Fridays, we do this live stream, typically, uh, until we start traveling again, which hopefully will be soon. Now, I'm defining soon as in within the next three years. Uh, but <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Anyway, uh, Ingen, thank you for cutting us some slack. That's one thing about tech. You never know how somebody is going to say your name. The name it's, it, it just again. Now, another thing you may be noticing this week is look at how Victor is looking. He's looking straight, at, into straight ahead, straight into look the camera. Me. 100 euros and off you go. You can actually look at the camera now. <laughs> was that about what it was? 100, 125? Yeah, something like that, yes. Okay. It wasn't much. I mean, it's a lot, but it's not. Not like some of the other things we were looking at. Okay, anyway, let's let's go ahead and get into it. Um, by the way, do you have your drink? You should always have your drink. Do you have your drink? No. You're still on Coke? Still on Coke. Okay. I'll open beer later. I think after... What your next one is, you probably want to have a more adult <laughs> beverage. All right, let's go ahead and get this shared. There we go. Okay, so this week's episode was about how to get started with CICD. And we went through all of the normal storylines of, okay, it's not a pipeline. Break out your tasks. Know how to do your task. Once you can do that, then really CICD is just automation of those tasks. Right? Plain and simple. Exactly. But then we got into being two old people. And talking about getting hotels over weekend releases and trying to get food and no AC in the... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those, those are the things that cannot come back. Those were they not... they do, I will retire early. The, yeah, those were not the good old days. Those were just the weekend days that you wish would finish quickly. But, so anyway, if you haven't listened to that yet, Podcast comes on a Wednesday, 6 a.m. Eastern, noon CET. So check that out for the next uh, next week. I don't even remember what it is. It's already done, and I don't know. Now, if you do have some spare time this weekend, after you listen to the podcast, first listen to the podcast, Honeypot has put out a documentary on Kubernetes. It's actually in two parts. The first part came out earlier this week. The second part just released about an hour ago at the time that we're doing this stream. So it's a two-parter around Kubernetes, the documentary. And you see all of the typical names that you have seen over time. The Kelsey Hightowers, the Joe Betas. Joe, forgive me if I'm saying your last name incorrectly. You see talk about Docker and how it all came to be. That was the first part, which was about 25 minutes. The second part, which again just came out a little while ago, is about 30 minutes. So you can watch an hour on the history of Kubernetes. Now I need to watch it. I want to see whether they're presenting also the conflicts, early conflicts. They, in the first part, I believe they did bring up some and how it actually came to be and how Google decided to open source it and whether, that, whether or not that was actually going to happen. It was actually pretty interesting. This was one of the few YouTube videos that I watched at normal speed. Normally, anytime I watch a YouTube video, it goes to 2x immediately. And this one, I actually just watched it at normal speed. I think I did. Maybe I didn't. By the way, the links to everything that we're talking about will be down in the description probably in a couple hours. Because I have, again, another meeting to go to right before we finish up here. So, I thought the first part was great. I have high hopes for the second one. So, And the other thing, Honeypot, which is the Buy Honeypot, which is down here at the bottom... Uh, their channel is actually fairly interesting. I would recommend subscribing to it. It's just they have some interesting storytelling on there. Speaking of interesting storytelling, 
Chaos Native, which they're right in the middle of their Chaos Carnival today. They're finishing it up today. Uh, announced their Enterprise product. This is uh, Uma and the other people at Litmus Chaos, which Chaos Native is the company behind uh, now Litmus Chaos. Announced their Enterprise product and also their cloud product. Nice. In beta. So you can sign up for that. In fact, you can sign up. It's free. You know, I really like announcements like this because probably not many people think in those terms, but when I see something like that, my first association, okay, so this will guarantee the longevity of that open source project, right? Uh, you need cash influx if you want to continue thriving as an open source project, even though people might be thinking, hey, this is actually all free volunteering, but there are people employed there. So whenever I see that a successful open source project starts getting funding, uh, it makes me happy. Yep. So check it out. I imagine this is going to go on your list. So oh, yeah. I, I will just let that be there. And going from something that is totally cloud native, looking at chaos, it's all 2022. Let's go back to 2008. Do you remember this thing called App Engine from Google? Uh, vaguely. Va and I think that's the key point here. It's vaguely remember it. This was, in my opinion, the first PaaS that existed. Yeah, it the was first true one of the first ones. Yeah, yeah. So, never really became a thing, right? Oh, it was a huge thing. In fact, there are still companies that are still running on App Engine today. Yeah, but I, uh, maybe I'm I, wrong. But I have a feeling that it didn't get as much traction. No, it didn't. As as as, as Heroku was supposed to. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, compared to compared to that, but. Uh, and the reason why they open sourced it is if you go down to the bottom, why make it open source? By open sourcing App Engine, and this is just the Java runtime, by the way. They also had other runtimes. I think they had Python. I'm sure they had Python. I can't remember what the other one was. Uh, you can run the whole environment wherever you want. Local environment, local development environment, on-premise in your own data center, and potentially on other platforms like Cloud Run. Now, why I would put App Engine inside of Cloud Run if I'm already at Google, why? I, I don't understand. Uh, I have a relatively simple explanation because Google probably okay. wants existing App Engine users to move to something else, and then that's that's potentially an exit. Hey, you can actually uh, lift and shift into Cloud Run. Uh, that's true. That way, you're not having to worry about messing up your runtime at all. You just Drop yeah. instead of drop instead of repackaging. Now you just drop App Engine into Cloud Run. Exactly. Bad Good idea. Shift. Okay. Um, so if you're one of the few people still running on App Engine, which I, I know of a couple companies that still are, uh, this is pretty interesting. I have to admit, pretty interesting. Um, where did I lose my mouse? There it is. This is one that threw me off this week. Magalix joins Weaveworks to bring policy to GitOps. This is another hot space, much like Bill of Materials and all the other things that are in that space. Policies and compliance. Uh, this is an interesting join up here, I think. Because now that Flux, and this they go into this uh, towards the bottom of tech example, Magalix I believe it's called Maglix. It may be Magilix as well. I don't know. <laughs> the G's are throwing me off today. Uh, governs Flux. So, you know, it works with Kubernetes, OPA, and the broader DevOps ecosystem, but has a special affinity with Flux, the core. Okay, so, you know, this is, makes the, this makes sense of why they picked them up because it's a sort of a marriage made in heaven. But policies can be used against the Flux delivery pipeline itself because that pipeline itself is declarative and lives in Kubernetes. So tight integration, but still can work elsewhere. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good purchase, I think. Yeah. What, whatever the purchase is. It uh, fills in fills in some holes in uh, Weaver's enterprise offer. Yeah. It fills it potentially well. I I haven't used it yet, so I don't know how good or bad it is, but. 
uh, WeWorks platform does need some sort of policy engine. What is Argo's solution? Do they have anything yet? No. Okay, I didn't think I mean, so. They are kind of, uh, I don't care, you know. Right, because it's, it's, it's not packaged is what I'm saying. There, there isn't a, an already pre-existing slice that no. you can throw into Argo. Okay, I didn't think no. so. Okay. So I, th I thought this is interesting. Just, again, this, this whole compliance policy, all this stuff is becoming a bigger yeah, deal than bill of materials, I think. And that's the type of tool that typically does not have amazing success in open source, in community, uh, but comes into question when you start thinking about enterprise versions, right? Security in general is where, where you sell open source, right? Oh, we have this open source enterprise, something built on top of open source. What are your enterprise specific features? Well, security scale. Those are the two main um, selling points. Yep. Okay. So congratulations to both the people at WeaveWorks and to Magalix. And please forgive me for completely butchering the name, I'm sure. Um, as of today, it is part of Weave, Weave GitOps Enterprise. I. Okay. This is a question. This isn't a bash. Okay. Why is it just Weave and not WeaveWorks? That's one thing I've never understood why yeah. they named it that way. I I Because I, I, I want to say WeaveWorks because it's just, it, it's just what I always say. But Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it's catchier. I, maybe marketing people thought that it sounds better yeah. Weave. People maybe. Were... Yeah. I mean, I, like I said, not positive or negative on it. It's just like I just, I'm just curious. What, what was the reasoning behind that? Not a big deal. Okay. Um, this one is a big deal. Big, long phrasing that basically means one thing. The AWS Cloud Map MCS controller for Kubernetes. Say that more than once fast. <laughs> it's, distribu uh... it's, it's distributed under Apache, so we're good there, right? So we're at Apache. It allows for multi-cluster service discovery. Multi-cluster, not just cluster-wide discovery, but multi-cluster discovery. What do you think? Basically, it's, a, it's, it's based around this cap right here. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I upload uh, AWS on open sourcing more and more things, but it doesn't have a good record that in terms that even when AWS open source some potentially really great solutions like Carpenter, right, which we talked about and I really like, uh, it doesn't get picked up. So they very often stay being open source AWS only something or mostly AWS something, right? So I, I would really like to see AWS open source projects getting adoption outside of, open, of AWS. Otherwise, it's almost like, hey, why would it be open source in the first place? Well, can we say that really this and Carpenter are the first two projects that they've open sourced in the Kubernetes ecosystem? Uh, first two that I know of, I mean, probably there are other things, but yeah. Well, first I mean, the other I, think, I know of. Well, they did the I, they did the EBS CSI as well, but you know that's just sort of makes yeah, sense. Yeah, there was didn't they open source but, also some Linux distribution, I think, and Java JDK something. Yeah. No, but I'm talking about specifically in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Yeah, Kubernetes. Right, so those, those two are the only ones I know of. Yeah. Right. So I'm I am going to reserve judgment on this. It's too early to say. I mean, Carpenter is three months old, maybe two to three months old. Yeah, yeah. So it's fantastic. And this is a week project. old. Yeah. So let's revisit this in a year and look back at these two and see what the adoption is, because the adoption may be even bigger, or not so much that it. You know, here's here's where the rubber will meet the road. Will Google and Red Hat also contribute to these two projects. Exactly. That's, 
that's the thing that I have certain reservations, right? And not this, not because projects are not good. Carpentry is amazing, but uh, um, I'm not sure whether others will jump in. We'll see. Yeah, if they do jump in, then that's going to because that's what made Kubernetes work, right? That's yeah. That's the reason why we're why Kubernetes was able to scale to where it is today. Think about it. If Google would not have open source, or excuse me, if they would have open source Kubernetes, but nobody else jumped on the bandwagon, except a bunch of little startups, would it have been, would it have gotten to the point to where it actually has its own documentary now? Of course it wouldn't. No. So it would be using Docker Swarm. Basically, what yeah. killed Docker Swarm is not design or this or that. What killed Docker Swarm is the adoption of Kubernetes. And when I say adoption, I don't mean users directly, but vendors. Uh, adoption, uh, sorry, contributions, right? Simply, uh, Docker could not compete with the pace of contributions to Docker, which at that time already had a lot of people contributing from Azure, from Google itself, from Red Hat, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So. Uh, Ron, hello, how are you doing today? Um, another big announcement this week was Rancher Desktop 1.0. Yeah. Have big you tried yeah. it yet? Have you tried no, it yet? No, not yet. I have it for this weekend, uh, hopefully. Okay. Try it out. I, I don't think that there is a huge kind of change. It's uh, yeah. simply, hey, now it's time to make it uh, promote, make it 1.0. Yeah. Um, at least I don't think that there are major changes. It's simply, it's mature. I mean, mature is a yeah. tough word, actually, because it doesn't exist sufficiently long enough to be mature, but it's yeah. uh, one of my favorite tools. Yeah, I was getting ready to install it, and then I remembered it requires Catalina. And, oh, I'm, still on, okay. and I'm still on Mojave, so... <laughs> Okay, go to the next one before I start uh, trashing you again. I saw this on Twitter today. I don't remember who who I saw it from. Have you seen this? Yes, I've seen it. Yes, yes. It looks good, but I don't want to use browser for that. That's my problem. No, it's fine. You don't have to use it. But for somebody that's just trying to figure out, okay, where do I even start? What do I want to do? A deployment? Yeah. Demons, right? It's like, okay, I want to do a stateful set. Okay, great. And now that tells me the other things I need to do. It's, I thought it's cool. It's a very good learning uh, tool. It's a learning tool, yeah. Because once you've used it probably two, three times, you're probably not creating very different type of applications over time. You know, you're copying and pasting most of the time. You exactly. need those initial f uh, number of manifests and from then on it's copy and paste, baby. Yep, and you can even edit straight in YAML here too. So I, th I thought it was pretty cool. I, Oh yeah, never saw it before. But anyway, um, Cube Orbit. Now this is okay. I'm gonna go back here for a second. Dark theme. I love it. Right? I can Which light it up. Which one is default? Um, my browser is set up as a dark theme, so their site was able okay. to pick up that it, I wanted dark. Nice. Uh, which in my other browser is light theme. I don't run everything dark. So when I landed on this, once I loaded up for the show, it was like. Oh, it's dark. Oh, right, because I run this browser dark. Um, unlike this one, which is light all the time. I, I am considering doing a, a light theme, dark theme for the website in mm -hmm. all my spare time. Uh, not anytime soon, but that will probably happen at some point. Anyway, I saw this I saw this tool today, Cube Orbit. It's an integration testing tool for cloud native applications. And I thought it was interesting in the fact, and it's, it's a project that's been out for about a week based on the commit. You create a channel. Ch they're using the word channel. So if you're a good developer, don't get confused. But creating a channel for your microservices in the test environment, then that gives a stable environment that y belongs to you. And the picture that they have here, which I think is pretty interesting, is, OK, you hit the gateway. You also give it a version 2, and it's going to route through whatever version two is. And if you were to take a look at the, and then it, it's got some dependencies on, you know, Cilium, Istio, Linkerd, so all these things are tied together. Um, 
I thought it's pretty cool how how it's how it works. But I was trying to find where. To, okay, get the quick start. Yeah. This is what I wanted to show. Come on. So basically, you define uh, CRD to get it in, and then you define the versions. And then when you're ready to start integration testing, you add a microservice. You add it to a channel, which this is too large. But you have a base and then a version one. Hmm. And then you set up your routes. V1 goes to V1. Otherwise, it goes to base. This was an Istio hmm. example. It's a, it's a nice wrapper around. Simplifies Istio configuration, right? Yeah. I haven't seen anything in the example that you cannot do without, but uh, it makes it much simpler. Right. like it. The only, the only thing I can, and again, I just saw it this morning, so I haven't even looked at it beyond this. They're, they're wrapping, or can wrap, Istio, Linkerd, and Cilium. So now you've got a one way to do it. Instead of, you know, all of a sudden your boss shows up and it's like, okay, we're moving from Istio to Linkerd the next week. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't happen, but, you know, at least in theory, this would take care of abstracting that away. Yeah, if, it, if there is a... Directive, we're moving from Istio to Linkerd next week. That means that actually the move started already a few months ago. Uh, exactly. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it, this sounds a bit like telepresence, and I agree with you. It does sound a bit like telepresence. Yeah. Um, but probably it's more it oriented cool. towards automated testing. That's what I'm thinking as well. But anyway, that's now open source. Uh, okay. HTTPIE. How many people still use curl? Raise your hand. Do you still use curl? All the time. Is there any the alternative to curl? Uh, this. HTTPIE. This is the okay. alternative to curl. It's curl for humans. Okay. Um, they actually have a phrasing like that on the site somewhere else, but 3.0 came out this week. This has been around for years, by the way. Uh, terminal, web, desktop, and mobile. So this, is, this isn't just terminal, but they've 3.0 just came out for Terminal this week. Uh, they're making a big deal about this nested JSON thing and speed ups and other mm -hmm. things too. And I looked at the nested JSON thing and I'm just sort of scratching my head and I'm not able to grok it today just because I mean, for whatever reason. Uh, can you put both on the screen, both examples? Just scroll a bit more. Kind of, is the first example really easier? Well, that's... So we designed it to high, the, the we designed it to offer the highest functionality with the best user experience. For that, we took an existing format, namely HTML JSON form, which I guess is this, and built the spec on top of it. Yeah, I'm just I, not convinced that actually I would go for the first instead of the second. To be honest. Well, okay. Here's one reason why I would. Okay. Um, if I was trying to inline this blob. And trying to get the slashes right, or excuse me, trying to get the quotes right, you get into weird quote issues, or you know whatever it is, right? There's, I'm not saying I wouldn't try to do this, but there's also a bit of, hmm, this actually looks interesting yeah. to me as well. Okay, fair enough. But fair again, enough. that's. It just sometimes it gets a little weird, and sometimes you know I'd, lo I'd love to hear a little more reasoning of why this was done. And there's the whole docs here of why. And the plugin manager um, exists now. Well, it's always been there. It shines with plugins, even though we never publicized the plugin API. And so now, blah blah blah, we make plugins first class citizens. Okay, so there's basically bringing it in. So now you can install your plugin nice. into that. Okay, whatever. Okay, anyway. If you've never used HTTPIE, you should for real use it. Plus, it just looks pretty compared to curl. This is what That's it will look like in your terminal. If you exclude the top part, you know, the headers, which yeah. you're not specifying anyways, yeah. it, does it look prettier? Yes. Okay, fair enough, yeah. fair enough. You should try it out. You can, you can, in, you can brew install it. Do you have yeah, to tap I it? I can't remember. I don't remember. Anyway, it's an, it's an easy install. Uh, one of the other Kubernetes-related things this week was Helm 3.8 came out. And everybody that I talked to was <clears throat> all bent out of shape in a good way about this OCI registry support for 
specifically for charts. Do you think it's a big deal? I mean, I think it's interesting to be able to store charts in a registry. I just, uh, I'm just not convinced that that's a better place than a Git repo. I like Git repos, kind of. I'm not sure what's the big advantage compared to Git repo. Now, actually, there is one big advantage. Maybe if you want to share with others outside of your organization, say, hey, you just kind of get it all from a single image. I think there may be that, but I still somehow like pull requests, Git repo, push there instead of register. That's me, okay. not necessarily yeah. everybody. Yep, and just adding support for Kubernetes 123, which is in another, how long? Nine weeks, 10 weeks, uh, pretty close. Is it that much? Ah, uh, in, yeah, yeah, something like that. Till the GAs, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, uh, Helm 3.8 is now out. Now, this company I'd never heard of before, Slim AI. And you may not have heard of them either. And I just saw them talking about, hey, we got our Series A, it's 31 million, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, okay, who are these people? And I finally looked over it. Oh, they're the people behind Docker Slim. Wait, but uh -huh. wait, wait, I'm in a completely wrong industry. Are we saying that Docker Slim got, is that the product? Uh-huh. 31 million Series A? Uh-huh. Man, oh man. Um, I mean, you're great. So, uh, con congratulations, folks it's, from it's, Slim. It's part, but it's it, part there of must what be they do. other things, right? They, okay, they have okay, other things. Yeah, that makes sense. I was kind of like, yeah. man, I could have created uh, Docker Slim. Um, yeah, but you, yeah, cool, I mean, cool. they, they've they've got other stuff too. But it's it's the backbone of everything mm -hmm. that they do, which is fortunately for us, open source. If you've Makes never sense. looked at Docker Slim before, and it's been out for a while, right? It's look at the version number. It's it's been around, and there's also a SAS for it if you don't want to run it locally, but it's for minifying your images. Come on, people! How many times do we have to say it? It is not a Docker image. <laughs> yes, yes. So it's how to minify container images if you don't know how to write do Docker file well. I doubt, I honestly doubt that it would minify it sufficiently if you do the right thing, but doing the right well, thing okay. might be complicated, right? So here, here's the funny thing. I wish they would show the real one because they're just showing, give me the first line of the Docker file and it was Ubuntu 14.04. Now the question yeah. is, was this the only line in the Docker file? By them specifying, give me the first line, my guess is no, but maybe it is. Probably no. Probably but, no, but could be. But now the other thing that's... Go ahead. That's the thing. There is a lot of things that you can remove from Ubuntu to make it slimmer. A lot of things. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised that Ubuntu itself could be compressed a lot uh, because simply there is a lot of garbage there. Not garbage, but things you don't need. Uh, now, uh, try to execute it against Alpine. And... Uh, and let's say Alpine and a binary that you compiled with Go. If those are the only two things, you might get like 2%, 5%, right? Yeah, I mean, in theory, you want to try to optimize as best as you can before doing something like this. But it's, I mean, it handles a lot of stuff for you that is pretty interesting. But if you look at this example, this image... It says it's sample node app, so my guess is obviously no, it's not just Ubuntu. But it's 432, just for magic number's sake. Yeah. And then it does its thing, and we end up at 14 meg. So we go from 432 nice. to 14. I don't know what the percentage is. Do they tell us what the percentage is? They should. Minified uh, by 30 times right here. Yeah. Nice. I mean, that would ha have to, especially if you're pulling your images and you've got egress, or if you're publishing images for people to pull and you're paying for egress on your registry. Oh man. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, you should start thinking about going away out of AWS in that case. Yes. But anyway, 
Uh, I thought this was a cool little tool. I'm going to try to do some stuff around this soon myself. And one final little tool that I saw this week that I thought was interesting was Atlas CLI. And it allows you to manage database schemas using, wait for it, HCL. Okay. Okay. Whatever. It's, um, uh, I'm, I'm, pleas I'm, I'm really surprised in a positive sense, how far HCL is getting. Yeah. It's uh, being used in many, many tools now. Sorry, Rosemary. I had to throw, throw you under the bus just a little bit. Um, but let's look at this, what their plan is. So you define your schemas using DDL or the Atlas DDL. So it's, it's HCL-like, it's Terraform-like. So it's not HCL, HCL, but it looks like HCL when it's all said and done. It only supports MySQL, Postgres, SQLite, and MariaDB for now. That's okay. But then you can visualize it. They've got a little UI that you can check it out with. But here's where it gets interesting is on migrations. You get declarative and versioned. Currently, declarative is all they've got, but versioned is coming. But in this part here, the declarative migrations are migrations of which the user provides the desired state Sound familiar? And Atlas gets your schema there. They say instantly. I'm not going to say instantly. Let's be realistic. But it's um, you're muted if you're talking. I can't see you. But it's um, it looks to be pretty cool. It's a it's a simple little app. And let's see, you, you can start up a little database, or you can do a little database container here. They walk you through inspecting and applying schemas do all the things. So it's like, um, and, I, I, it's cool. Yeah. And, uh, I'm not sorry to be honest, uh, that they did not implement version yet. Declarative is really, I want tools to do the work. So I don't yeah. want to specify my schema. Hey, now you need to do this because the that current schema is that no, it's, it, yeah. that should be the job of a tool to figure out what yep. needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, you can look at this example here for this table definition, and we were joking earlier about migrating from Istio to Linkerd. Something more realistic is, okay, we're going to move from Maria or MySQL to Postgres. That could happen. And do you want to rewrite all the DDL specific to MySQL for Postgres? True. I don't. And this, this again, this sounds familiar to Liquibase and Flyaway because it is similar, right? It's, it it's in that same vein which is fine, but this, there's just, um, the way that they're positioning this, and I, the, I'm saying they, um, oh, by the way, they didn't pick up dark automatically. Shame on you. Um, Shame. If you look at the project, uh, okay. So there's nine contributors used by this many people, and there was a release a day ago, roughly. Yeah. A Apache licensed, and off you go. If I only so, had a database project to do right now, I would try it out. <laughs> but I don't right now. Yeah, I, I saw this. Um, I saw this decision chart the other day. It's like, uh, should I start a new project? And the decision okay. tree was, if I say uh, yes, the, then the answer is no. You really don't have the time to do that. And if you say no, what was it? I can't remember what the no was. But they were both yeah. like, you're crazy, right? Exactly. Have you seen that one too? Yeah, I saw it. Okay. Yeah, exactly. It's no in, a, in any case. It's no in any case. You, no, you don't have the time. Are you kidding yourself? Uh, speaking of kidding yourself, you got into Rancher again this week. Are we, yeah. are we, are we Rancher fanboys today? Is that what it is? I Talked like about it. about twice. I mean, I like where it's going. There are a lot of, there are some missed opportunities right now, which I hope that Rancher is working on. But uh, I like Rancher today much more than I liked it a year ago. So a year ago, I said, don't, just don't, don't. But with uh, Rancher Kubernetes Engine 2, one of the problems is removed, even, even though it's not ho completely there. They are integrating with, it fle with Fleet, which again, it's not fully there, but it shows, shows signs of greatness. I like it. So basically, you're saying in about 12 months, like we, we, we need to revisit a lot of things in probably 12 months. Yeah, 
Yeah, we'll see. We'll see where it gets. But I have, I honestly have high hopes for Rancher Fleet in general. Now, not necessarily within the context of Rancher itself, uh, but Rancher Fleet gives me a very, very good vibes, and I, I was very pleasantly surprised when I saw it in Rancher. Just Rancher needs to figure out the name for Rancher. It's kind of, it's very confusing. <laughs> kind of okay, so it's Rancher and then Rancher Fleet. Yep. If you put some words after Rancher, then put it for all the products. That's true. That would be a, a good idea. Um, like I said, we're going to sort of roll a little bit short today. Uh, Givaden, good to see you. Work is getting in the way, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Hang on a second. Talk, talk for a second. Yeah, it is getting in the way. And, uh, okay. Uh, it's what it is. And soon I'm it will for be work. more complicated, at least for us. So you will you will be missing less streams because there might be less streams. Less streams. Yeah. We start traveling. Uh, by the way, we didn't say it. Uh, you had a couple of streams this week, or videos around a new project that your company open sourced. Uh, yeah. So I didn't pull it we up. have. Was that this week? Huge was announcement. That yeah, this, this week, week is okay. official, even though it's open source, so it existed for a while. But yeah, yeah. it's official now. We have 100% coverage for AWS Azure. Google and a few others. Uh, so that was a very, very big deal for us. Very big. Okay. Come on. Good to see you here, Mohammed. Um, Mohammed has a question. Let's see if we can squeeze it in before we got to cut short. Is Historic credentials. Is secrets or is environment uh, variables in Kubernetes? Secrets are not accessible by anyone. Is wrong from security perspective. So uh, secrets in Kubernetes are not sec secretive, to clarify. They are very easy to access. Uh, and now how easy it is or not to access is depends really of how you set permissions, which processes in which people or persons can access what in Kubernetes. But if you run just vanilla Kubernetes with root access, yeah, the secrets are absolutely nothing. And even if you do RBAC well, Kubernetes secrets are not meant to be used directly. They are just a a bare minimum uh, uh, on, on top of which other providers should build solutions like HashiVault, for example. But yeah. HashiVault, on the other hand, can be a whole lot of pain by itself. So there's that. Yeah. And we're not planning on fewer streams, no. but it's just it's reality. It might of, happen. It might happen. And not, not in like big chunks. Like, yeah. Just I mean, you know, we will start traveling, that's for sure, sooner or yeah. later. Now, I'm pretty sure that Darin will say the same. I will be bringing equipment with me, but you never know, kind of like, hey, which continent we are on and whether we can be at... It's not about location, but more what are we going to do when we are traveling. Yeah. So, that's it. But I'm not planning on traveling for a while, still. I'll go kicking and screaming into that airplane fuselage. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, we hit everything, and I do need to run to this other meeting. So let's wrap it up quick. We should be here next week. I don't see a reason why we wouldn't be. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is pretty funny. Digital DevOps nomads. That would be nice if we could do that. Hey, my, my big plan is to move for a couple of months to Australia. That's my big plan, which has been postponed already for a couple of years because of COVID. You never told me that before. You're just now breaking this to me? I thought I did. Yeah, yeah. so th that's, that's the idea, kind of do some, you know, those uh, swapping apartments. Uh, Somebody comes yeah. to Barcelona to yeah. our apartment, we go a couple of months to Australia. So that's the plan, but you know, uh, we yeah. have no idea when Details. that will be possible. Yeah, talk about and a country that's people. locked down. Australia is locked down. Exactly. Not only just Australia, their their regions are locked down. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's not that would make happen. the stream miserable because you don't wake up in the morning, and so that means I would have to do it in the middle of my night, probably. I uh, I have no idea. I cannot that would even be bad. <laughs> I have no idea even kind of what's the time difference with Australia. Okay. I do. No, no, nobody, nobody speaks with people in Australia during working hours. Right. So it's 16 hours from where I am. Okay. So it's 
so like when I talk to some of the guys from Australia that I work with, they're as my day, like at 6 p.m. my time, it's 10 a.m. their time. So I guess we could do it. You know, at noon your noon Australia time would be, only be 8 p.m. my time. That's not too bad. That's an hour before I go to bed. So that would work. I'm figuring it out. Details. The, the least problem, that's the least of the problems with my plan of, uh, to go to Australia. Yeah, just think. What's it going to be like to really travel like that again? I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I've lost my... I don't know where... Okay, this is really silly. There it is. I need to clean up the, the back end of this. Okay, anyway. Thanks for joining us live here today. Uh, we will be back next Friday. No reason why, why we shouldn't be at this point. So, uh, Thanks for hanging out with us live today if you're watching the replay. Thanks for hanging out till the end. By the way, if you're still here, uh, go ahead and check the thumbs up before you leave. And if you haven't subscribed, go ahead and subscribe. And uh, we will talk to you again next week. Cheers. See you, bye.